Welcome back to Collapse Life. I'm your host, Zara Sethna. For most of you watching and listening, wherever you may find yourself, the fact that we've been lied to by elected officials and governmental agencies over the last several years probably comes as no surprise. The trust horizon, that is who and what people believe, has shrunk to the point where people don't trust doctors, doctors don't trust the CDC or the FDA or the WHO, hardly anyone trusts the mainstream media, and the government, well, forget about it. So can trust ever be restored? That's a question for our guest today, Dr. Kat Lindley, a family doctor from Brock, Texas. She's also the president of the Global Health Project, a coalition of organizations, experts, and advocates formed in 2023 to try and restore trust, protect health, and defend our ability to make choices about our bodies. One issue that Dr. Lindley has been very vocal about is efforts by the World Health Organization to negotiate a quote unquote pandemic treaty. And we'll hear more about that today, as well as what else the United Nations has planned with its, with its upcoming Summit for the Future in September. So Dr. Lindley, welcome to the program. Thank you, Zara, for having me. And before we start, I want you to meet my newest member of the family. Ooh, hello. This is our biscuit. Biscuit, biscuit. Hi, buddy. Welcome. Biscuit, Thank you for buddy. joining us. He was running away from our cats. So. <laughs> well, congratulations. Anyway. And thanks once Thank again you. for being with us. Um, I want to start with um, asking you a little bit about the mission of the Global Health Project and um, you know how it came about, what your aims were, and what you've been able to achieve so far. So we actually got together over a year ago. I, I can't even tell you. It seems so long ago. Um, just kind of coalition of uh, different organization, scientists, physicians, moms, activists, different people um, around the United States and the world actually got together trying to figure out how do we change the narrative that was happening at the time. As you said, there is definitely a breakdown in everything that we believed in, in science world, in medicine. So how do we start this conversation over and try to get back to that period in time when we actually trusted our physicians and the um, you know, medical community and legal community for that matter. So uh, we got together on a project and the project was uh, restoring trust in medicine. And uh, eventually the organization evolved into, um, it's called Global Health Project, but sometimes we joke that it should be called Global Freedom Project mm -hmm. because we're kind of taking this position of um, trying to see what's happening around the world, United States, you know, Europe, uh, Australia, New Zealand, everywhere, and then try to create a conversation and uh, try to find solutions on how to uh, help people navigate through all this. And that's kind of how most recently it evolved into this World Health Organization work that I've been doing a little bit more of because of the imminent you know, meeting that's happening in Geneva. So tell us a little bit about that, and then maybe we can go back to some of the other things that you have planned with um, the Global Health Project, but obviously this WHO, pandemic treaty or agreement or whatever it is, is a big one. And it's something that you've been very vocal uh, in speaking out about. We've also had Meryl Nass and James Roguski on this show, and they've also been vocal opponents of it. How do your efforts dovetail with theirs? So your listeners probably understand uh, why many of us think this is important. But to walk everyone through maybe my experience through it, I used to be part of the World Council for Health, and um, we started tackling this on really early on, uh, kind of probably by March of 2022. Uh, but what happened in December of 21, the leaders of you know G20 nations and the uh, World Health Organization, they all got together and said, oh, we cannot let this ever happen again. We need to do a better job. And uh, they started negotiating the treaty. And at the time, I believe it was even called pandemic treaty. At this point, it's called an agreement. Mm -hmm. And I think people need to realize the name changes that have happened, they, this evolution actually serves a purpose because along the way, there was a lot of 
resistance towards the document because you know and, and you like i said your audience knows this from james and from merrill um most of us feel this is an attack on national sovereignty on personal sovereignty on your autonomy to make decisions with your physicians there's a talk of censorship sharing of pathogens vaccine production over and over and over and over again and pandemics uh you know like over and over like we always live in this perpetual state of fear so everyone understands why we are vocal but what they realize because of this resistance that has developed over these past few years treaties are international binding law they are agreements that if they're passed as treaties and there are certain requirements to be considered treaties they have to go to our parliaments and in our case our senate to be ratified mm -hmm. and they need two thirds of the vote they don't have two thirds of the vote in the american senate for sure right. because senator johnson just signed a letter with 48 other senators so you have 49 senators who signed the letter uh, telling president biden do not negotiate with the WHO. And if for some reason this thing is passed at the WHA, which is the World Health Assembly, then the, then that they require the document to come to Senate to be ratified. So that's why there was this evolution of name change. Because, and they also done some editorial work on it to take the language out that makes it a treaty mm -hmm. because they realized they cannot get it passed. Right. at least it cannot get ratified right so it's been really interesting watching the war health organization the past few weeks and actually today i posted on my twitter um, they are also negotiating these in, uh, international health regulation amendments and it looks that they have uh, passed some kind of preliminary agreement hmm. uh, and they are hoping that they will pass those next week so I don't know, I just find that that kind of stuff fascinating because you can definitely see corruption of the process. For sure. There's so many follow-up questions that I have, but one is, mm -hmm. um, so if we've moved away from the language of treaty and onto agreement, does it still make um, that agreement binding in some way? Does it still have the same threats to our sovereignty or to our- hundred um, percent. Yeah. And it's still a treaty. I used to actually go along with it. I used to use the names that they wanted to use. So like like I said, it used to be a treaty. Then it used to be, I think, zero draft. Then it used to be CA++. It used to be accord. And now it's agreement. So I used to go with their name changes. And I would call it whatever they called it. But then in the past few weeks, I decided, no, I'm calling it pandemic treaty because it's a treaty. And I really think we all need to start calling in pandemic treaty. Okay. And if you want to put in your parentheses agreement, whatever, do it. But it's a treaty. The only interesting thing is, and this is why I love legislation. I think you know that. I, I really am fascinated by it. I don't want to be a politician, but I, I like working behind the scenes. So what happened, I don't know if you remember Paris Accord. Yes. It's called Accord, but Paris it's Accord was change, actually right? also, yeah, but it yes. was a treaty. It was a treaty, but the uh, President Obama, Obama said, it's not really a treaty. It's just like a continuation of an agreement that we had. So I'm just gonna sign it by executive order, which mm -hmm. he did. But now if you go to United Nations website and you look up pandemic accord, it says it's an international binding um, document, which mm -hmm. means it's a treaty. Okay. If it was just an addendum, or an amendment or whatever, it would not be internationally binding. So our politicians on both sides of the aisle, but in this current environment, Biden administration is trying to play the same game. They're trying to say, this is just an agreement. It's really not a treaty and we, we're, we're okay with it. Mm -hmm. So I think it's gonna be very interesting to see what happens if it's passed at the War Health Organization Will Biden try to say it's not a treaty? If he does say it's not a treaty, what are the Republicans going to do? Uh, what are the states going to do? Because uh, state AGs wrote, there are 22 of them that signed the letter as well regarding the World Health Organization. I suspect that if this is not ratified in the Senate, 
that the AGs will probably sue the administration. Mm-hmm. And um, it might go even as far as Supreme Court. But it's right. fascinating, actually. It, it is fascinating. And it's also super complex. And I, I think they're probably aware of that, that, you know, there's there's state laws, there's municipal laws, local laws, state laws, national laws, and then this international regulation language. And along the way, we're all supposed to understand what any of this means. And obviously, we also have our lives to lead and we're not, you know, international legal experts. So they know that they're going to lose people along the way. And yet there has been this resistance that you're a part of and that you've been leading. Uh, Do you think that the the our government and the uh, the leaders of the World Health Organization were surprised by the resistance? I think the World Health Organization was surprised by it. Um, and I think the resistance ramped up this past year, this past six months significantly. Until then, there were you know a few people talking about it and some African countries actually defeated amendments in 2023. Uh, But interestingly, I forget if it was maybe 11 countries, 11 or 18, but I think maybe 11. One of the reasons they defeated the amendments is not because they felt righteous about it. They defeated them because they felt that they were not getting the same financial incentive as other countries. So that's significant. So so now the WHO had a whole year to pretty much buy them off, for lack of a better word. Um, to agree with it. So it will be interesting to see how many African countries are going to remain kind of resisting, although I don't think many. Mm -hmm. Uh, David Bell, also, uh, who is a physician from uh, Australia, he has degrees from Australia and uh, England as well. He used to work at the World Health Organization. And he's been also another leading voice in this resistance. And he's been doing a lot of work with the African countries to show them how many aspects of these documents are not good for them. They're not good for anyone, but in spe- mm-hmm. specifically for um, you know disadvantaged countries. Right. So it will be really interesting to see what happens. But what, what World Health Organization is doing now also is something called consensus vote. So, for example, Slovakian prime minister that was just in the news that was shot, mm-hmm at his inaugural speech said that he is going to do um, investigations in the COVID inquiry type. He was against the Ukraine war and he said he's gonna take uh, Slovakia out of the World Health Organization. Few days before he got shot, the health minister said that Slovakia will not agree to the uh, documents. Wow. And then Tedros went to meet with them. And from what I understand, from what I've been told or read, I forget which one it was, but Tedros um, has told them, don't don't show up for the vote. Slovakia? Yeah, it's okay if you feel that way, but don't show up. Because what happens if you don't show up, then you can get consensus vote, Mm -hmm. where whoever is there says yes. and, And because I don't know, you know, I love board meetings. I'm terrible with Robert's rules. I was a president back to back of two big medical organizations here in Texas. And I, and my um, executive director knew that like she has to hold my hand through the procedures because I could never remember Robert's rules. I would always forget to like to ask her any objections or whatever. But in Robert's rules, sometimes you can bring certain aspects of agenda as a consensus vote. As long so as nobody kind of, opposes, then it exactly it tacit agreement. Because as soon as someone opposes, then you have to go to vote by one by one by one by one right. by one. It has to, you know, because sometimes like you'll have several things on your agenda, and you know that all of those things are everyone agrees with. So you say, okay, let's vote, you know, Article five to ten through consensus. Right. That's kind of what they're going to try to do. So it's going to be really fascinating to see what happens, because World Health Organization is known for doing these procedural tricks where they say, well, we voted yes in the committee, so we're all for it. Mm -hmm. And they kind of tried to do that last year. I don't know if you remember, I think it was September last year, United Nations. There was some kind of resolution. It's probably someone in my Twitter files 
because I remember posting on it, but they were doing some kind of resolution saying that they all love and agree with the pandemic treaty. But the country said, no, 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 we don't. We have reservations. So, and the um, secretary general was going to do it by a consensus vote. And the country was like, no, 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 no. So finally, he actually had to say in his speech that United Nations thinks it's a good idea, but he could not say that the countries agreed. Right. So this consensus vote is an interesting uh, tactic. We'll see what happens. But there is definitely a concern that they may, and, and, and again, you know, they are just signaling. Maybe they're signaling because they want people to stop meeting and telling their MPs they don't want this. So you have to be, as, okay, I'm going to take a deep breath. My message today is no matter what you hear that comes from the World Health Organization or United Nations or WF or any of these leaders, what our job is to continue doing what we're doing, talking with our legislators, talking with different countries' MEPs, talking with our groups, and continuing to reject this. Okay. It's not over until it's over. And even at the end of June 1st, they will meet again at the United Nations in September. They will meet again next year. So this is not over until they completely abandon this idea that we need pandemic treaty. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the most important message that you and I can share today. Okay. Keep it's, on going. It's Don't give up. It's over. And one thing I yeah. wanted to ask you is, so um, because they have a lot of um, global eyes on them as they go into this World Health Assembly, which is coming up very soon, um, is it possible that they back off some of the con controversial components, but then they slip them in elsewhere? So, for example, in September, the United Nations is having their summit for the future, and maybe they just show up there and they maybe say, oh, these are the words that are triggering people, so we won't use those words. Is that something that you're forecasting? 100%. But actually, you don't even have to look as far as September. Just look at the current document. The new draft of the, of the pandemic treaty says that this convention of parties, whatever they call it, they don't have to, first of all, we don't know who's going to be part of that committee. And they don't have to give us details on One Health until May of 2026. So essentially, they want people to sign on on pandemic treaty. And there are a couple of places where they say they don't have to give us details until May of 2025. And One Health specifically is May of 2026 which means that we're going to sign on now, but we will find out two years from now what's in it and they're going well, to we implement it anyway. So it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. So you have that. And then, like you said, you have this summit for the future that's coming up with United Nations. And for those who haven't read about it, you can look it up on United Nations. You can just Google Pact for the Future and the summit is called Summit of the Future. Essentially, they have not met their sustainable developmental goals. They were going to meet them by 2030. They're not even close. So what they're trying to do is kind of reimagine it, put a little bit more meat on it, and then they all are actually going to sign this, this pact for the future because it's more of a, like, resolution, like, you know, an agreement that we're going to do this. Mm -hmm. And I think every country is going to sign that in September. So, yeah, we have a lot of new things to look forward to. Yeah, the, you know, the, the ones we've been focusing on aren't even done yet, and there's new ones coming. But, yeah, but and, the, I've, and I've said something funny before before we continue. Someone said to me, what are you going to do when the war, when you, like, war health organization is defeated or whatever? I'm like, there's going to be something else on the horizon, and there already is. Yeah. Yeah, so. it's. I mean, it's not a, a goal that any organization like yours wants. You you would love to be able to close up shop and say mission accomplished, mm -hmm. but it's not likely. Not anyway, anytime soon. These um, exactly. 
these goals and it's funny that they're not even calling it goals this time. I think that's really interesting as well. I um, have said on this channel before that I used to work with the United Nations for a short time and uh, I was there when the Millennium Development Goals were coming to an end and the Sustainable Development Goals were being adopted. And it feels to me like the narrative is we set ourselves some lofty goals, but we aren't on track to meet them or we've we've met some, but some others are falling behind. And then in this past 15 years, the, the world has changed and we have new challenges. So now we need new goals. And oh, by the way, we're going to need a lot more money as well. What's your take on that? Well, they, have, they definitely want more money. And even the World Health Organization, the treaty and amendments would increase WHO budget by 10, 20 times. I forget what were the last calculations, but by significant amount of money. And they want member states to give them the money. Also, what people have to realize, United Nations and WHO have this symbiotic relationship with the uh, central bank and the IMF, right? So, you know, people always say, well, what will happen if we don't comply with what World Health Organization wants us to do or United Nations? You know, everyone's like, do they have an army? Are they going to send the blue helmets? That's all nonsense, right? They don't need any of that. They have central bank and IMF. Those are the bad guys. They're going to call in the loans. They're going to call, put the economical and financial pressures on countries to agree to it. And that's how these things are going to be done. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, um, I don't remember all those goals off the top of my head. I actually just did a presentation in Italy on them. And I went one by one, but I don't remember them all. You would think that ending poverty would be number one or ending hunger, you know, but not. Those are not number one goals, according to the United Nations. Number one goal is climate change and global governance. Those are the number one and number two goals as far as they're concerned when it comes to sustainable developmental goals. It has nothing to do with actually helping the people. And that's what you have to realize. Even this World Health Organization, I know I go back and forth, but they really work together. The WHO um, Treaty and the amendments to IHR has nothing to do with war health organization actually keeping the world and people healthy it has to do with war health organization empowering themselves to be a big player in this global governance that united nation and wf are promoting mm -hmm. you already mentioned um one health and i kind of wanted to go back to that and, and unpack it and especially kind of tie it to the idea that climate change is now um, one of the top priorities of this new pact for the future. So One Health, in my understanding, and I would love for you to correct me if I'm wrong or unpack it a bit more, it's, um, it's basically an idea that um, we need to be coordinated and collaborating at all levels of society, at all levels of government, because um, health is, is so interconnected with um, with every aspect of society and with animals and with the environment, right? So um, with a one health approach, law enforcement can be involved, um, vet veterinary services can be involved, social workers can be involved, psychiatrists can be involved. I, I mean, it's, it's pretty much all things at all times in a public health emergency. And now public health emergencies can be triggered by climate change and climate change can be controlled by geo geoengineering. So it's like this very tight, closed in um, control grid, isn't it? It is. Essentially what One Health says is that lives of humans are not more important than lives of animals, plants, and it's all interconnected with the climate change. So essentially the World Health Organization would control every aspect of life on earth. That's essentially it. Um, you asked me before, and I don't know if I actually answered this, you talked about the language being changed in the treaty and the amendments. And it's true. Language has been watered down. Some things have changed. They changed some definitions. They've taken out binding because they knew that people didn't like it. 
But what people have to realize, despite the language being changed, the intent of the document never changed. So you really have to look even at the older you know, versions of it to see how far they want to go. But at some point, they discussed that this public health emergency of international concern that the, that the director general can declare can really be any threat to public health. Mm-hmm. I think they watered the last version of that down a little, but it was insinuated that, for example, um, gun violence can also be right public health emergency. Right. They tried that in New Mexico recently. Yeah, exactly. So, so actually, that's very interesting. You you have to look at these things that they try in different states. Exactly that. They try to say that it, that that terrible incidents that sometimes happen in the United States, they try to highlight them and how that's a public health emergency because they're trying to connect all this together through One Health. Another interesting thing is avian flu. They really are working hard to sell us on this idea of spillovers, that you have a zoonotic disease, something that infects animals, that has spilled over and now has caused disease in humans, right? So we have that case of avian flu in Texas. And they're like, and you read the article and the article is like, it's so bad. If this gets out of control, 50% of people are going to die. And it's like, it's almost like you're watching a movie. And then you like read the last little paragraph and there's one little line that says, and the Texas man who got avian flu had mild conjunctivitis. But in the meantime, they just told us we're all going to die from it. Yeah. And it doesn't pass from human to human, only from animal to human. And so far, they and again, two, they have to prove cases. that, right? Have they really proven that? Right. Because, and, and then like yesterday, I was again on Twitter. I spent way too much time on Twitter on X. Mm-hmm. Um, a friend of mine, Sam, Dr. Simon Gadectal, he actually, there was a dolphin that died. I want to say it was Florida. And then they actually did PCR tests on him and they figured that he had, I want to say it's avian flu again, <laughs> but it's like the 20 times worse than ever any strain that we ever had. Right? Mm-hmm. They're like, they keep on looking for something. They keep mm-hmm. on trying to get us to really be afraid of life so that they can make these decisions for us. And that's where this global governance aspect comes into it. They really don't want people to make decisions for themselves. They probably really hate the United States Constitution because the United States Constitution talks about individual rights a lot, Mm -hmm. talks about freedom of speech, talks about the right to bear arms, talks about the rights that federal state cannot have, that the states have. They really don't like our country because of all that, because we are torn in their side because of this fact that we believe in liberty and these big organizations don't. Correct. Um, So you're a family doctor. You work directly with your patients of all ages. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted to ask you, let's take a little bit of a a devil's advocate view. Um, So in dealing with your patients, is there any role, let's say that all of these agendas that we've been talking about are, we put them to the side. Is there any role as a family doctor for a global coordinated health response? Is there any way in a perfect world when global health policies would benefit you or your patients? So I actually had a very good conversation with Dr. Jay Bhattacharya. And if you guys like to listen to him, you should probably listen to our podcast. And, um, I understand the need for public health. And I would say that the science of public health used to be very, very good, um, especially when it was done by physicians and and scientists, but mainly lots of physicians used to do public health. Now the uh, subject matter has kind of changed. You can choose to go into public health without any background in medicine. And in my opinion, again, uh, I feel that, first of all, public health has been weaponized. Mm -hmm. And 
they look at the problem differently than I do. So for them, they will look at the population size and make decision what's best for the majority, right? Uh, they're not going to look at these outliers. And for me, my job is to look at an individual. Mm -hmm. So let's say you have something that will save lives, right? The story that we've been told is going to save lives. And we all have to have it because we all have to have it to save all the lives. But what if you're that one person that will actually die if I give it to you because you have an anaphylactic reaction to something in it? Should I give it to you just so I say that I saved lives so that you number, just that you did statistics? I think the um, science of public health has gone away from health to numbers. Mm -hmm. And I, because they don't do patient care one-on-one, -on -one, because they don't have to look people in the eyes when they're making this, these decisions, I think it's a little bit easier mm -hmm. to make decisions based on statistics than it would be if you actually had to make it, you know, if you had to look at like a family of 10 and then decide out of those 10 who lives or dies, right? Yeah. And I know I'm being a little bit, um, you know, pushing it a little, but that's what it is. Yeah. When it becomes just a number, statistics, decisions are made on a different level than when you actually are in, involved right. in day-to-day -day lives of these people. It's so more I about think policy be, and, and not so much about health anymore. It's more about policy and less about humanity, I think. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's kind of what I would say, that human, humanity and, and element has been taken out of the equation because you don't you don't think about numbers the same way you would think about people with faces and names. Mm -hmm. um, what would a, a good public health policy look like that would actually help your work? So, you know, something that maybe um, addresses the underlying causes of non-communicable disease or something that... Well, um, even... Go ahead. You know, if you go back to COVID, right? Vitamin D, that could have been an easy decision on their part. Sun, good, good nutrition, just immune system support on any level, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's uh, vitamin D, vitamin C, um, some zinc during the pandemic, elderberries, all of these like common sense things like healthy lifestyle, you know, don't eat fried foods go out in the fresh air and exercise, stay in the sun, plant a garden. All of these little things could have helped boost people's immune system and also have given, would give them something else to do other than stay in front of a TV and watch and be scared. scared. Yeah. Yeah. I think those type of things could have been done. And um, if you look at, uh, you know, postmortem of COVID-19 policies, uh, I'm sure you read that they came up with six feet apart because four was too little, but 10 was too much. So that's how they came up with six. There was no scientific decision behind that. Right. And then even masking, I'll, I'll give you my experience on masking and then you tell me what you think about this policy. So in a hospital, if you work in a hospital, every year you have to go to infectious disease department, you know, uh, it's like a control, um, ID control department. You have to be fitted for a mask, for a N95 mask, because the mask has to fit to your face. So they put a plastic helmet over your head. It's a hood. And they spray you with different chemicals. And the one that I always remember is saccharin. Mm -hmm. If you taste saccharin in your mouth, it means that the seal was not good enough. You need to change the size of your mask. I had to do it every single year. I used to complain every single year because I would have to wait a couple hours and I've never changed from when I was in medical school. And then the masking started. So they did a full blown thing. We had a gown, a mask, visor, hat, gloves, everything. They ran out of that. So they got rid of visor. They stayed with N95 mask. They ran out of that. So they went with like Chinese version of N95 that really wasn't an N95. 
They ran out of that one. So they said surgical mask was okay. They ran out of that one. At one point, CDC said bandana was fine. That's when I knew the science didn't work. You didn't have to convince me. And then there are a zillion and one study that shows you it doesn't work. But you don't need scientific data to tell you it doesn't work. Because trust me, bandana doesn't work. Right. So that's kind of when you talk about public health, how do you restore trust in public health after all this? Right. You know, four was too little, 10 was too much. So we went with six feet apart. Really? And that's yeah. kind of, we're kind of left with the ruins of public health. How do you get, get it back? And I don't know that they really will be able to. Well, unless they um, put humanity back into the equation, as you said, um, I, I don't think people will trust again. And then there is a potential for some, some real damage to happen if people don't trust the, um, the systems that are in place to help them, if they, don't, if they stop going to the doctor unless they're, you know, bleeding from their arteries, then it, 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 there is actually potential danger in that. Um, there is, and that's kind of where Global Health Project goes back. You know, we, you said, let's talk about it at some point. And we did that video. Um, it was a story of six different health professionals showing their own journey into realizing that the system is broken and how did they think we can fix it. What people have to realize, this has not only been an awakening for them, it has been an awakening for lots of physicians as well. You know, we had CDC, NIH, Lancet, uh, New England Journal of Medicine, FDA. It's almost like having, you know, Vatican, Catholic Church, Methodist Church, whatever, Bible, and all of a sudden they're telling you it's not real. It's mm -hmm. kind of that kind of awakening moment for a lot of physicians and now we're left with the ruins of medicine what do you do so for those of us who have tried to do our best to really serve our patients what i try to tell people is we have to restore the relationship back you know, I hear a lot of times people will say, well, I'm never going to go to the doctor. I'm never going to go to the hospital. And my, I always use this example because it illust illustrates it really well. If you're having right lower quadrant pain that's getting worse and you're getting nausea, maybe vomiting and a little fever, I really hope you go to the hospital because you're going to die from sepsis and from appendicitis. There needs to be some common sense and there needs to be physicians and other health professionals who truly love what they do. Mm -hmm. The onus is on us to do the work, right? I totally get it. But I hope that we can get to that point where we can work together. And when you're looking for a doctor, if you find someone who is not listening to you, just leave the doctor, go find someone else. Mm -hmm. You know, go find someone that you trust, that you actually can make decisions with not someone who's going to tell you what to do. I always tell my patients, I can lead you to water, I can make you drink. Right. And that's how it's supposed to be. I'm supposed to give advice. You're supposed to listen and say, well, I agree with you or I don't. And if you say I don't agree, then we're supposed to discuss it and see if we can find this common ground where we both are happy. Because right. ultimately, you are the driver of your health. Um, and I think that's been good about what happened because people have realized that they don't need a doctor for many things. There are a lot of things that everyone can do on their own. Like I said, if you keep healthy immune system, you probably 90% of the time don't even have to go to the doctor. But when there is that 10% of the time, I'm hoping that we can start having conversation and restoring that trust in medicine because allopathic medicine still works. It's still good. Uh, I, there's other medicines that are great you know functional medicine chinese medicine uh i can never say are you aware that so mm -hmm. that's my accent for that one but all of these you know um old schools of medicine have taught us a lot as well yeah. and i'm a, a osteopathic medical doctor so we have been taught lots of aspects of this through medical school and our mindset is really 
that um, is you have to take care of body, mind, and spirit. You don't just take care of the body, otherwise you're going to fail from the beginning. Yeah. So I love that philosophy. Um, I wanted to add to that that um, people may not know your background, but you're originally from Croatia, um, mm -hmm. and so I wanted to ask what role you think that um, upbringing might have played in shaping your own views on not just on medical care and patient care, but just on the world? Do you think that that had some trigger for you in making you speak out during COVID? Um, well, it has, you know, I grew up in communism and um, I left Croatia when uh, it was Yugoslavia at the time, when I was 18, one day before the war started, well, one day before Split was attacked, the war already started. And I went to live in Italy for five years and then I came to the States and, um, you know, I experienced my own version of American dream, as I like to say. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, you know, what this country stands for is very important, but I think that kind of shaped my practice of medicine too. First of all, in Croatia, you know, I, when I go back home, it, it always makes me laugh how life is different. You go shopping every day for your food. You go to the fresh market every day. You know, you, first of all, people always get, and, and this is, I'm actually making fun of myself for those of you who don't know. I love yoga pants, you know, just like sweatshirt, sneakers. I barely ever put makeup on and I just, you know, go out, do my things, shopping or whatever. No, back home you get dressed. Makeup, dress, shoes, you know, it's all, it's like the whole outlook is different. Yeah. You know, you wake up in the morning, you're all like put together, then you go to the market, you buy the food, you walk there, you, you meet a couple of friends on the way, you have coffee. It's like, it's just, it's just such a different way of life. Mm -hmm. And I'll illustrate why all this matters. So then, you know, you go home, you start cooking, and the family comes home, and everyone has a meal. And then, you know, you take a nap in the afternoon a lot of times. Siesta is important. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, people go back to work, whatever. And the same thing happens for dinner. Dinner is usually always lighter. And then you go out for a, for a walk and during summer you have ice cream or whatever. But all of these things are promoting that healthy lifestyle. You know, going out to walk, being in the sun, laughing with your friends, eating healthy food, drinking lots of water you know, using healthy ingredients, all of that actually helps your immune system. And going back to health and medicine, people always ask me, what's the best diet? Mediterranean diet is the best. Fresh food, fresh foods, colorful things. Mm -hmm. If you eat things like that, you know, you will maintain your weight and all that, but also you're putting all of these good nutrients inside your body. So because of that, I've always kind of felt when I was talking to my patients, you know, if they have diabetes, hypertension, or cholesterol, whatever, I would always tell them, well, tell me what you do. I would always, always ask them for a diary. Mm -hmm. What do you eat? What do you do? How much do you sleep? Are you walking? Are you driving? Because the lifestyle that we have is so busy, that has so many stressors on us, that our body is under this constant um, attack from every angle. So your starting point is already different. And I think, you know, having grown up in Croatia kind of shaped the way I practice medicine. I don't really do medications right away. I will eventually if I have to. And sometimes I have to do it from the beginning. But I always try to figure out why are you here? What caused it? And then if you kind of unravel that mystery, you end up realizing a lot of it is just the lifestyles that we have and stressors mm -hmm. and the fact that you're not sleeping because you have a paper due or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's so simple and yet um, so elusive to so many people. I remember at one point in my life when I was traveling a lot and had a, a high pressure job and I just wasn't feeling well, I was tired and I couldn't really put a finger on it. I remember going to the doctor and um, he did all these blood tests and um, all the, all you know, what a doctor does. And then asked me, as you just said, 
but tell me about your life. What do you do? What's going on in your life? And he almost laughed as I was talking. And I think I probably laughed as I was talking because I heard myself saying, yeah. I said, you need a vacation. You don't need a doctor. You just need to relax. Stop stressing yourself out so much. Um, and just hearing that actually, it, it, you know, made me blush, but it also kind of made me laugh at myself. And, and just it, that's, that in and of itself gave me faith that the doctor saw who I was, not just what my body parts were or the, the function of my system. You know, they, they actually saw me as a person and said, you don't need any help. You just need to relax. Um, well, so the I first thing I do when someone, you know, when someone says they want to lose weight, everyone wants me to check their thyroid, which is fine. I have no issues because thyroid can definitely be a problem, but it's never thyroid. It's very rarely a thyroid. I always tell them, take a week or two weeks and write down every little thing that you eat, especially if you are a mother or a caretaker of children. Write down every little thing you eat because you don't realize, especially as a, as a caretaker, like a mother, every time you pick up after your children, there's like 10 goldfish left and you really don't want to throw them away because you just paid for it. Or there's like half a banana or there is this. So you like right now at the end of the day, you're like, huh, I really did eat a lot because you think I only ate like two things. You know, I just had like lunch and then a little thing for dinner, but throughout the day, you you do a lot more things than you realize until in your case you have to say them aloud but a lot of times i'll have people write them down because they don't know what they don't know type of yeah. A thing yeah so. you do you just you just ca kind of carry on especially if your life is very busy and you have children and all that you just sort of push through to get from hour to hour and you forget about thinking through mm -hmm. all those things um one last little anecdote. We we had um, Joel Salatin on this program. He's a, a farmer and kind of the, the godfather of sustainable agriculture in America. And he was talking about how when he travels to Europe, just to kind of tie into your conversation there, that at the end of a meal in Europe, people say, how was that? And at the end of a meal in the United States, people say, do you want some more? It's just a totally different perspective on, um, you know, the quality of the meal versus the quantity. Not that we don't care about mm -hmm. quality here, but that the first thing on our mind is, have you had enough or can I give you more versus did you enjoy the meal I prepared for you? And I thought that was such an interesting little um, highlight. Well, that makes me happy because I actually do it all the time. I didn't know that I do it, but I, I actually did it yesterday too. I always say, how was it? So that makes me happy that I'm continuing the tradition. I didn't yes. realize it, I do. That's great. Well, I so appreciate all that advice and um, all that guidance about the World Health Organization and just about our personal health. Um, before we go, uh, tell people how they can find out more about you and what you do and the Global Health Project. So Global Health Project is on x as global h project and our website is globalhealthproject.org um probably the easiest way to find me is on x which is k l veritas v e r i t a s and i also have my own practice in texas which is lindleymedical.com and you can send a message from my website it will come into my email and uh, and i do respond um and then before we close since global health project is um, sponsoring, there is something called uh, Road to Geneva. Hmm. It's by Inspire Network. Uh, they are having a summit in Geneva um, on 30th and then on June 1st, they're going to have a rally in Geneva, right as the World Health Organization, the assembly closes. And the rally essentially is saying, no matter what you decide, we are the eight billions and we're going to make decisions for ourselves. So I just want to mention that because Global, H Pro Global Health Project is one of the sponsors. That's great. We'll, we'll definitely make sure that the audience um, finds out how to follow along and participate in that. Great. great. And Dr. Lindley, if, um, if I may, before you go, I hope that you'll come back and uh, give us an update on how things are going in the next couple of months. Sounds good. Maybe we'll meet at the end of June after Super. the vote and we're gonna try to unravel what happened that would be great thank you so much thank you
So if you've been with us before, you know that Collapse Life is all about opening eyes and providing practical solutions. And so we're very grateful for guests like Dr. Lindley for being able to provide us with that kind of useful knowledge every week. But we can't do it without your help because we talk about topics that are very often outside of the mainstream narrative. We are being censored and suppressed. So please, if you can like this video, hit the subscribe button and share it with others. This information is too important to keep hidden from view. Collapse Life is a thinking person's guide to civilization and demise. And we're so happy and grateful to have you on this journey with us. Be sure to follow us on Substack at collapselife.substack.com and also join us on Twitter at collapse underscore life. And then head back here next week for another episode of this podcast. We've got another great guest coming up and we look forward to seeing you. Until then, keep your chin up. It's only collapse. See you soon.